is Minda Wilson with Urgent Care. I'm excited to welcome my guest, Dr. Keith Kanner. He's a certified personal coach practitioner and a USPTA coach. And it's, it's really about taking someone's uh, performance and making them a 10 on a 10 scale in terms of performance, which I find really fascinating. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Kanner. Well, thanks, Martha. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being there. So, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, aspire to be professional athletes or uh, entertainers, and and the and and the level between uh, success and failure is just that extra level of mental preparedness and mental effort, and and that and that's where you sort of work taking people into that space. Is that correct? Um, yeah, Marty, what I try to do is everybody has their own in, in, inbred talents that some of which you're, you're born with some of which you aspire over time. And what I try to help people do is help them design their life the way they want it to be and use scientific models to help them get there. So performance science is fascinating because it has a lot to do with neurology and in this day and age, <clears throat> we've proven and shown now that you really can actually teach old dogs new tricks. And so the world of mindfulness and neuroplasticity is now at the top of neurology and, in many cases, performance uh, work, which I do with athletes and professional musicians and actors and actresses, where you try to bring out the best of the best. And 70% of a person's success in a sport or anything else is based on their mental state, not their physical state. So you can have an athlete who is an okay athlete, but if their mindset's in the right place, they win. So it's how you think about things, what models you use, how you utilize yourself as your own personal internal coach, telling yourself what you want and how you're doing it, and practicing. And that's the key. Practicing, practicing. And now, practice. In the, this, pra pra practice, <laughs> practice doesn't make perfect. Pra practice makes habit. So habits generally take between about three to four months of continual practice to make. And just like extinguishing a habit is about the same way. That if you stop doing something for about two to three months, you'll lose interest in it. But if you do something consistently every day for 21 to 28 days starting on the three-month model, it becomes a routine. And you actually start to enjoy what you're doing, such as going to the gym. But you actually have to go to the gym for – a month, month and a half before your brain registers that it's part of a new habit. So performance is fascinating. And during this time, I say to people, well, we're the most creative and we utilize our best resources when we're in trauma. So we learn from being in pain. And I try to work with my clients that way in this time when I've got athletes who don't know whether the season was going to go or not. The draft's easier. It was really tough for baseball and football. Um, my rock artist wins the next concert. So trying to keep people focused on something, a goal, is difficult in this time. So that's when I try to get people to be creative. Use this time to try to breathe and think of things that you enjoy. Think of things that you can do, that you can master, and spend time creating it now. If you unfortunately lost your job or you're on furlough or some other tragedy with which so many people have had, Try to switch your brain into thinking more on who am I and what can I do and what talents do I have and what can I practice now that could be used later. And when people do that, it's amazing what they come up with. Sometimes careers change, but research has shown that we do best when we're challenged to change. And that's right now. So when, when, how do people challenge themselves? Like what, when somebody's sitting at home, what... What process can they take themselves to, through to sort of figure out what they could do to make their lives a little bit better? Well, if you break, I have people break down their lives into the physical, um, the emotional, the social, the interpersonal, um, academics if you're in school, um, work if you're working, self-esteem and self-confidence and outlook. And when I have people design things the way they want them to be, like in the physical, I say to people, how, how do you want to feel? How do you want to be? 
And when I get a, a picture and have them kind of mindfully figure that out, because I do something called a vision board, where I have people actually try to look at themselves in the present and decide what they want to improve. And together we use scientific models to get them there. Um, it's really knowing how you want for yourself to be first before you start to change something. Same thing with happiness. Uh, right now, uh, I usually I use a 10 scale. <clears throat> 10 is beyond happy and zero is not so great. But right now, um, optimally, people try to perform up to eight, nine. Most people can't do that right now because of what's going on. So you're having to dig deeper into to doing that. So first, you have to know how you want to look, how you want to feel, how you want your social life to be, how about your marriage or your interpersonal life. You have to kind of know ahead of time, okay, this is how I want it to be. And if you know ahead of time, and we use different types of cognitive models, neurological models, uh, physical exercise models, your brain actually will change and form to that as long as you exercise it. You have to exercise your brain to get it to change. So the first thing is knowing what you want. Once you know what you want, then the question becomes seeking how you're going to do it. How, how are you going to get these things done? And then having a, a method of, of what you're going to do on each step along the way. And then you're not sitting around anymore, Marta. You're actually doing things. So what about people who don't know what they want? How, is there a way that they can become more clear? Well, you have to ask the person. If a person doesn't know what they want, then they're not happy, obviously. They're confused. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's really important that people have to say, okay, well, if I can't think about anything that I want or I'm happy about, then maybe I need to figure out why I'm so unhappy and deal with that first. Something's holding them back. It could be themselves. It could be a bad relationship. It could be all sorts of different things. But when I get someone who says, I, I, I don't know what I want, how I'm going to be, then if you look at that from any sort of a performance model, um, it doesn't look very good. So at that right. point, you want to ask... So you want to ask yourself, um, what, what, what might I be interested in? Start to quiz yourself. Um, right. To, but to I'm design, looking, design a planet. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, looking at, um, I'm looking at athletes now who are sort of being torn in two directions. Well, on the one hand, they want to play sports. They want to play basketball. They want to play baseball. They want to play football. On the other hand, they feel very passionate about uh, the political situation, and they want to make change that way. And it seems like that those two things seem to be in conflict. They can't really do, seem to do both at the same time. So how do they reconcile that conflict? How do, you, how do they move the needle on both things? Well, it's a tough one, and a lot of it also depends on what levels sports you're playing and the philosophy of coaches and how that all works. So it's, it, it's a tough one. I think most coaches these days are trying to help their athletes focus on minimizing any external noise when you're participating in your sport. In other words, I teach people how to become mindful, and that's a performance technique where you learn how to eliminate anything else that might be going on in your head while you're focusing on you, yourself and your body and your sport. So it's sort of compartmentalizing, so to speak, mm -hmm. that there could be all these political issues going on. I have this going on with all my athletes right now, and they're competing. They're in the NFL, and they're in baseball, and they're doing their thing, and having them separate. Look, whatever's going on, that, that's something that is important. But when you're focusing on your target, your sport, nothing else matters but your breath and your focus on relaxing and doing what you know to do. And when we do that, things get better and better. So it's learning how to manage your anxiety, how to turn on things and off things in your mind, which we have techniques neurologically to help people do. And that helps you focus on being a better athlete or a better parent, student. So it's all how you, where you put it in perspective and how you think about it and when. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that people need to need to compartmentalize is, is basically and and compartmentalize well, effectively um put it aside yeah uh, for example you know putting politics on the side when you're competing in your sport um mm -hmm. when we're not into the mentalization of what we're doing in terms of our sport or anything else then our performance goes down and we can't play well and so the gift of, of athletes and professionals is to be able to manage their stress and to kind of say, okay, I can 
get into that discussion at another time, but I'm not going to let it interfere with what I have to do right now. So that works with athletes very well. I have this going on with teams and they, they, most of the teams I know, they have a pact. Listen, we're not going to talk about that stuff. We're not going to get into anything political. We have to focus on our sport. And that's where most top end coaches of in NFL teams and NBL teams are, they're look at their athletes and go, look, you know, we're in a, we're in a shit storm, uh, but Hey, focus on the ball. That's what we're here for. And let's not get into anything else. And, you know, in, in all these sports, true athletes, it, it's a brotherhood. It, it doesn't matter what color you are, or, or where you're from. You're, you're together, helping and working together. That's what a team's about. I just wish more people could do that. So I don't see, in, in, with most pro athletes I know, I don't see a lot of, of conflict out there between where you're talking, even with the college players, that they're taught. There's a time and place, but when you're together with your team, it doesn't matter. You're with your team. Focus on doing the best you can collectively. And that's an effective technique cognitively that works with. So how, how can we get people to, uh, to be, be more that have different goals or different viewpoints or different politics to sort of come together and exchange dialogues then? Well, are you talking about in, in terms of like your on the football field, are you talking about like be a little, can you be a little bit more specific? So, so a person that so like we, right now one of the big problems we have in society is that people can't talk to each other. We have a lot of anger, a lot of hate, a lot of uh, you know disconnection. Um, people are losing relationships over politics, and we just can't seem to build a dialogue. So, what can we do to okay. sort of help 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 with that? Now, are you talking about as of now in the present with what's going on with with this pan, with pandemic, or are you talking about in general? With pandemic, that with politics, bit. with Black Lives Matter, with there yeah. seems to be so many things going on that are keeping people apart. Well, it, it's it's more than that. Um, it's driving people crazy. Um, being um, having to follow certain types of un, un, unknown or habitual things that were kind of told to do in so many different directions makes anyone feel unstable. You're, you don't know what's going to happen between, between masks, between rockets, between black lives. There's so many different things that have gone on now. Um, again, it's election year. Second term seems always to have something happen. Um, but people are very vulnerable right now, Marno. That's the problem. So right now, the goal is to realize everything is under a pandemic umbrella right now. I say to people, look, um, Right now, 25% of adults between the ages of 18 and 24 are presently suicidal. That's a quarter of people between the ages of 18 and 24. Domestic violence has gone up 87%. Okay. Uh, it's horrible. Relationships, kids at home, no friends. Um, it has caused so much mental turmoil that dealing with that, at the present is, is what's most important. So it's hard to kind of know and plan ahead when you're in an environment that at this point is very uncontrollable. So how do you get control? And that's where you have to focus on yourself because we're the only ones who can do that one way. So at this point, collectively, the idea is that recognize that you're a human being. That's the key to, in any of these conflicts. Let's stop talking about color, Creed, right? Any of that. Let's talk about being people, humans. So if people were actually operating on a level of being human beings, then none of this really matters. That's how you get to it. The idea of every feeling like everybody is a human. And that collectively brings people together. So that would be my vote. Recognize that you're all on the, we're all on the same team. Whether it's a sports team or, or a life team, um, we're, we're all in this together. And if collectively people worked like that and had leaders who worked like that, then I think that we would have a much better chance of creating better dialogue. So it's, it's, it's the, so the thing that people can do is just sort of recognize the humanness in other people and start from that point. Well, humanness in yourself first. Okay. That's the key. I mean, nobody's perfect and people have to recognize that we're human beings and we make mistakes and we do the best that we can. So yeah, recognizing that, we're, we're all human creatures. I, I mean, that's a really, really important piece. It's interesting that you know we're mammals, and we're like the only mammal 
that really doesn't follow that. Bears, I mean, bears get along with any kind of bear. They're just a bear. But, but you know, humans can't. And because more advanced in terms of us having a cerebral cortex and things like that, that make us smarter and think in the abstract, but it also limits people um, of being able to be together without having to find some sort of faction, which is sad. It is it's terrible. And the level of, and people now you're saying are, are suicidal. They're coping with depression. What, how, how do they, how do they change things along? You know, how can they change their own mental situation? Well, so you, do they end? You, well, well, with that percentage, that the national statistic, um, they get help. You hope they get help. I mean, the idea would be that in, in a population where people at this point, and it's understandable, there, and any sort of weakness that one may have right now, if you have a, I don't know, if you have an itch, it's going to be twice as bad because people are under so much stress. So with people who obviously are at that level um, feeling suicidal, then they have to get help. They're, at that point, you, you need to get help. You need to call a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a therapist, or someone and, and really get on that quickly. But I think the point is that this has caused such a regression in all humans that everybody's on edge. Part of what's going on um, with the violence is the effect of cabin fear, that people have just had enough and can't take it anymore, and that brings out the worst in people. And we see that in social psychology, that in large groups where there's civil disrest, then humans act worse than we've ever acted, and that's what's happening now. It's on the table with what's going on right now, um, presently, in some of our states. Mm. But bringing people together as the same team, human, is the key of any sort of performance method that we use, whether I use that in corporate business or I use it in music or I use it in um, other realms. It's about bringing people together for a common cause. That is what unites people. And it's beautiful because you're just doing the best you can as a human being. Hopefully, you know, helping each other, not hurting each other. It's fairly idealistic, but if you get down to it, it's very important. So how would an average person tap into a program like yours? I don't advertise my program, so um, mine, is, mine is word of mouth. Um, I think the key would be to look for mindfully based interventions. So we're looking at something called mindfulness. Um, we have a mindful center uh, in San Diego here at UCSD. And we, in that center, people go through courses and learn how to become self-regulated, how to be mindful, how, how to put your sword down and work to, together collectively with other people. So mindful-based interventions are really at the cutting edge, and they're neurologically based. And so that, those can work. Those can help. But people have to be motivated to want that. You can't change unless you want to change. And then even if you want to change, it's still hard because you want to go back to what's familiar, that's your brain, and you're pushing it to do something different. So it's not only saying, okay, I want to be a better person. I want to become more humanistic. You have to work at it for at least three months before it becomes ingrained. But that's okay. <laughs> people, are, people are doing things right now. I've had all my clients uh, during this time. They, they, they have to be creative. I, my, my joke is you have to make lemonade. You have to be positive. And so I've pushed all of my artists to write music to get ready for next year. Uh, they're all doing it. Their albums are ready to go. They're ready to get on the road. Uh, the football players are back playing. Baseball players are back there. So it's, it's, it's moving forward and being creative during this time. And that also brings other people up and gives them hope, which is great. So my advice is to take a deep breath, realize that we're in it state of disorganization. Um, we don't have much control about anything that happens outside of us, but we can take control of ourselves and calm ourselves down and work on things that we feel are important for ourselves and everyone else. So that's a very important time that we can do that and need it. I don't understand how people self-motivate. You know, what, what, what yeah. turns the trigger on that? Well, um, you have to, well, self-motivation has to do with, well, the first thing is you have to decide, or at least cognitively or intellectually, that there's something that you want to do. Now, if you can't figure out what to do, then 
seeking some help would be important. Um, you know, I, I say to people, though, just close your eyes and try to imagine things that you would like to do or could do, even if you've had no training doing it. And people come up with all sorts of different ideas. I've seen people come up with uh, you know, side hustles, you know, Saturday jobs that they come up with where they ended up because it was creative. They made more money doing that than in their normal job because it was something they loved. So motivation comes from seeking your own passions, your own passions. So you mm-hmm. just ask yourself, what are my passions? And everybody should have passions. I find that people balance, there's a balancing between pay, people's passions and then their obligations. They may have family or children they have to be responsible for, parents. It's, it's an interesting balancing act. Well, it's called, it's called structure. Um, in my program and what I have to do with my clients is everybody has a planner. You have, you have a schedule of your day. And in that day, it's broken into four components. One of them is self-care. Big time. You have to take care of yourself. Another one has to do with industry, working or going to school. That's another side. Then you've got your social time, family time, and then you've got your passion time. So there's play time. And if you organize your day around those principles, people lead a very healthy and happy life. It's all mm-hmm. about being able to stay calm and balance your life. But you can get it in. It's a question of just planning it. And it's funny. People are always so resistant about keeping schedules until they start to keep one and they realize that they actually have more time than they thought they did. It's funny. Yeah, that works. Or people think they can memorize their schedule in their mind or keep it on their phone. It doesn't work that way. If you write it down and you try to keep it fairly consistent, like when you're going to get up and when you're going to exercise and when you're going to go to work or to school and when you're going to spend time with your friends and your family and also when you're going to eat, um, then your your body and your mind work together in a forward fashion. And that's the healthiest means of how people can keep going. It's were you all, were you personally always this rigorously disciplined or, or did you go through a process of change? <laughs> oh, I, um, I'm a big believer that you, you, you can't do something unless you've gone through change. Um, no, I've gone through my own positives and, and negatives. And I think that what I've learned is as I've gone through them, what it's done is it's just made me better, more creative and passions have increased. So, no, I mean, I think that we all have, you know, our history of hard knocks. Um, Some of us, self-included, sometimes you have to get hit pretty hard. But eventually, I think as you go through things and commit to just making some changes, and you start to do it. And once you start making some changes, your brain becomes more plastic. It becomes more oriented. It's plausible. It works. And what I have people do in my program, aside from the goals that they're working on in terms of change, is I have fun things that I have people do neurologically that gets their brain to lighten up. So you have to wake up in the morning and be grateful. Mm-hmm. So could you give us an example of a quest, of a person who's sort of going through this process? Sure. I can think of um, a number. Um, I'll stick with kind of an, an age group, which is particularly uh, vulnerable. And that's men between the ages of about 24 and 29, where there's the sense of not, feeling necessarily solid in who they are, what they're doing. And they're not perhaps graduated from college or have been working, but they're not in an area yet where they make enough money to support a family. Whereas many women who are more emotionally intelligent tend to do better than the men in this age group. So one was uh, sent to me um, and he just felt sad and kind of lost and wanted each of his areas of his life to improve. Um, and wasn't very motivated. And the one thing about performance coaching is it's very consistent. Um, I'm on my clients. So I push them and push them and push them to get to where they want. So this gentleman, we went through and looked at his complete life and looked at how he liked things to be, if it could be, on all the domains. And then we set out means, practical means, uh, behavioral means of working towards those. So in each area, as we were working on these goals, he's also doing mindful exercises. So at the same time, we're working on things like mindfulness and emotional intelligence, which is also allowing his brain to change, doing healthful things all day long, eating right, exercising. And slowly, within about four weeks, um, the analysis of my stats in my program has shown that people start to feel better all the way around. And that was consistent with this guy. He started to feel a little better. 
After six weeks, even better. After eight weeks, not only did he feel better, but everybody around him said that he seemed and looked differently. Um, he ended up getting everything that he asked for in the program and left in a very, very good state of mind. Um, and the two-year follow-up has been terrific. Um, got, got a job, is moving up, um, and is seemingly very, very happy. So, um, But that's hard work. That's someone who dedicated themselves to doing these practical things every day. Motivating yourself means sometimes you have to take it to make it, you've heard. Mm -hmm. um, I say you got to practice it to make it. If you practice it, if you practice an instrument every day for 10 minutes, you'll be able to play it in four weeks. It's anything we do, but you have to. So the motivation I mean, that comes from the person saying, I might not feel it, but intellectually I want it. Once you start doing it and systemically you're on a schedule, your brain starts to like it and then needs it. So you're getting so, your, your, your it, you're developing better habits in your brain. So it's, 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 it's essentially like a workout. You know, people say, people say they want to go to the gym, but until they yeah. actually start going and it's a habit yeah. and it becomes right. a habit and they get right. them, they're not going to get themselves in better shape. If people say they want to lose weight, but then they have to develop the habits of better eating. And if they yeah. don't do that, no, then, then it's not going to They're not going to change. Right. So then the question is, happens with New Year's resolutions, and I've written about this before. Um, the intentions are great. Everybody joins the gym. Within three months, they're, they, they drop out because the consistency is not there. And forcing our, our brains to do something that we think is good for us, but we don't want to do it, is a push. It's a self-push. But when people push themselves, Minda, that's when they develop self-confidence. That's where it comes from. You have to see yourself perform to feel good about yourself. It can't be anybody else. It can't be somebody cheering for you. You actually have to witness your success to develop your own self-esteem. So you have to push yourself to do something with people who are like this gentleman. I had, I had to really push me, I had to push to get him to exercise, okay? Push him to change his diet to eating small meals during the day. Push him to actually say hello to people so he wasn't feeling so socially isolated. All these different things collectively together and your brain starts to change. And then your behavior changes, and then the person changes. I use self-affirmations in my program also, where most people don't easily tell themselves their positive qualities. Well, research shows that if we actually write those things down, I am this, I am that, I'm kind, I'm loving, and you write it on your mirror, and you read it out loud every day for 30 days, guess what? All of a sudden, you believe it. These are scientific models that really help people take charge and change. And it's actually fun. Um, most people find my program fun because they make it fun and moving and movement. You have a lot of humor, things like that. Um, there's lots of ways to get your brain to loosen up to change. And it's the process of what I told you is neuroplasticity, which is actually working on changing neural pathways. It's fabulous. It's where we are now in, in neuroscience. Does, does it work for people of all ages? So can somebody who's 70 change or do they yeah. have to be young? Yeah. No, um, any age. Um, article came out in two different journals. Um, the immediate version was uh, can, an old dog can learn new tricks. So learning goes on forever as long as you have a motivated person. And yes, with kids, when we actually start teaching kids mindfulness, how to breathe, how to breathe. Most people need to hold their breath 68, 70% of the time. Well, when you do that, you're cutting off oxygen to your brain. And then when you do that, we don't do well. So I teach people to breathe consciously. And when you put that and help a child or a small kid utilize their breath to calm themselves down, their anxiety goes down and they don't get into conflict as much. So yes, I apply, apply this technique to a 18 month, a child who was biting her newborn brother. So I helped, uh, I, I threw a, a wedge in the middle where I actually gave a color, a colored tennis ball to this little girl and said, look at the ball and breathe before you bite. And so it stopped her. And so she took a deep breath, looked at the color of the ball, and didn't bite her brother. So that's, yes, so the learning piece to this is at all ages. And it's not terribly complicated. It just, it just takes practice. Wow. So, so with when that's something that may work for kids that are home now who are stuck at home. Yes. I mean. Absolutely. Oh. I've, I've been working with lots of families right now because of this. And how do you keep your kid on track? Um, 
at the, the school one, I'll give you an interesting story. Um, kids these days, most, well, we're going on, on, finally, most kids are at least online where you can see your classmates and your teacher. You're not left on your own to try to figure out what, how to do your classes and parents are forced to be teachers. So routine, routine, routine. So one of the things I had parents do was uh, like a school bell. I had one, one, one father buy a gong. So what he did is he kept his kid on the same schedule at school. So when the gong went off, it was get up, and then it was have breakfast, and gong was go to first period. So the kid would sit down, do, and then the two bells to get from first to second. So put them on a well, put put them on a bell system, and it worked. So routine in that exercise, we got to get them outside. Okay, friendships are tough. Um, that's been the hardest one. Kids miss their friends. That's probably the most important piece of why kids like school, and trying to you know, facilitate somehow, some way that they that they get their social mix. But living that close of in quarters with kids and parents all day is something that makes most people feel very, very, very uncomfortable and anxious, parents and kids alike. So keep your kid moving. Keep them on schedule. Uh, do the bell. I love the bell system. The bell system works. He bought a gong. The dad also just to spice it up. I think he bought a kimono robe, too. So he walks around with this gong. Boom. Six o'clock. Kid gets up. 6.30 breakfast. And it works. Because the... The, the kid is responding in his brain to what he's familiar with, which is the bell system when he's in school. So scheduling, keeping your kids on schedule, matching schedules, um, making sure that they're distraction-free when they're doing their school work, but making sure that they've got fun things that they can do after school, after, mm -hmm. so they have something to look forward to. So this is where you have to be creative and structured, um, but that seems to work. So interesting. So what you're saying is that as keeping somebody, so helping, helping your family is keeping your whole family on a schedule. Maybe not just your kids, but yeah. you too. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Everybody. Um, Cause you have this happen when you have people stuck at home and they're used to a routine where let's say they go to yoga or they go to the gym or they go to church and they can't somehow, some way we've got to utilize that familiarity in some other context. And that's why we've seen a lot of things go online. I have a number of colleagues who are, personal trainers and, and yoga instructors, and they put all their stuff online now so their clients can see them. And it's a wonderful way to get that. And it's easy. Anybody can search online on YouTube and find something. So, yes, a schedule that involves health. You want to make sure that you're eating and that you're sleeping, all the things you need to do, um, and that you are breathing and try to relax yourself. Don't try to future trip. That's the biggest problem people have is the what ifs. What if, what if, what if. And Science shows us that when we try to predict the future, we're really bad at it, Linda. Like, we're wrong 71% of the time when we try to predict something. Just like we try to guess how somebody else is feeling without asking them, we're usually wrong. So future tripping only does one thing. It makes people worry. So don't future trip. If I can keep people focused in the present, looking around and focusing on, let's say, the positive things around you, because we do have a choice of what we think. And you can choose to be a human. You can choose to say, look, all this stuff's going on, but I'm still going to be friendly. And every day, try to say hi to people. It's hard with a mask. But I do it every day. I get the what? <laughs> I, go, I went, hi. They go, what? I go, hi, hello, hi. Oh, hi, hi. A funny technique. But, I, you know, I should. but we've got to be positive. So positive thinking. Hold on to what you can control. I, I love the – this is a creative time, you know. Uh, do things that you enjoy. Um, use your mind. Try to create something. Journal. Think of things that you might want to create. Because these times when we are in critical trauma times is when we are on the verge of something great happening. Each time. For everybody. And we get not, when people knock down, you have, to, you have to feel pain in order to grow. So that's what makes the motivation um, into difficult. Is what motivates people? Okay, that the pain of change is, 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 is better than the pain of staying where you are. You have to ask yourself, is this really how I want my life to be or do I want to change it? But with science, we can change it. That's the difference now. It's, it's neurology. It's, different, it's a different story now. It's actually really kind of cool. I like it. So people want to get in touch with you or want to learn more about your programs. What's the best way for them to do that? Um, I do have a website that um, needs to be updated, but it's uh, Dr. Keith 
personalcoach.com. I don't even know my own website. Isn't that horrible? Yeah, it's Dr. Keith personalcoach.com. Um, I know. <laughs> um, and so I, I have three different things. I have my own, um, I have my own coaching, co- coaching practice here. Um, and I've got um, contractors that work with me too. I also work for Dynamic Sports Group, which is one of the top sports um, agencies representation where we represent many pro players. And so I'm their performance coach with them. And I also work with Live Nation and Sound Productions, where I work with a lot of bands who are working on improving their performance on stage and writing. And it's fun. Sounds wonderful. It sounds like you've sort of moved yourself into your top performance mode and well, made a good. Yeah. That's why I developed this program. I mean, going back, um, I decided that I really wanted to do something that involved you know, the complete human, not, not just one part. And so I did this program. I created it by looking at change models and tested it with a population. And I put myself through it and I live it. Amazing. Well, Dr. Kanner, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And I look forward to talking to you again. This is Minda Wilson with Urgent Care.